fucking Jim Hall, Courtney, Atheist Edge, getting me out here in the sun. So that's, that's, and I think also because he's not a historian, he doesn't have automatic background knowledge, and so he should be fact checking some things. So, for instance, he made a claim that we don't have census records or death certificates or anything from the ancient world, which is actually massively false. We've got lots of these kinds of documents. We just don't have them for Judea, which would be a, like, a more correct thing to say. It's like, yeah, we can't expect to have the death certificate for Jesus. That would be a ridiculous thing to expect, even if the one existed. So yeah, that's the fact that we don't have it is not an argument that he didn't exist. The thing you want to know what I say is just go to richardcarrier.info and check out what's up uh, in the uh, right hand side margin. You can go look at um, bring down the drop down menu and see appearances where I'm going to appear next. I'm touring all the time, so if you want to come see me talk or just hang out and have a drink or whatever. Yeah, I, I pointed that out too that the Herods are actually better attested, but th that's uh, that's of course the circular argument. You're saying like, what do you mean by attested? Uh, do you mean just it's mentioned in myths? You know, like, so if it's like the Gospels, you have to actually establish that he is attested. That's the thing. And if it's all based on the Gospels and the Gospels are mythological and all other references to Jesus are based on the Gospels directly or indirectly, you actually don't have any attestation that Jesus is historical unless you can actually establish that you that can the get Gospels were legitimate. You can get history out of the Gospels, yeah. So it, it just goes all the way back to the same argument uh, all the time. So I don't think that kind of argument is sound. And I give examples on my blog of Hannibal, Spartacus, um, Julius Caesar, someone even tried to say, uh, Alexander the Great. Uh, there have been actual legit scholars, like even more renowned than Ehrman, who've said, uh, Sanders, for example, said that uh, Jesus is better attested than Alexander the Great. And that's like the most absurd thing to say. And that's an example of like, did you even check? Like the, the kind of evidence we have establishing Alexander the Great existed is massively extensive. Now we can't expect to have had that kind of evidence for Jesus, even if he did exist. So it's, it would be an unreasonable comparison. Lots of myths do that. Urban legends do that, for example. Um, mythologies do that, where they actually get real things in there. Like there's a lot of actual real cities and, and uh, names of kings in Homer, for example, that were real. But that doesn't mean like that the gods were meddling on the battlefield. It doesn't even mean that there was a battle of Troy, as described by Homer. Like it's, so the fact that they get uh, some details right and put it into a particular historical context. You could say the same for Osiris and Romulus and various other figures perhaps, but um, and the cargo cults from their teachings of John Frum and uh, Tom Navy and so on. These are Tom Navy. Yeah. I've heard of John Frum. Yeah, There's, yeah. A Tom Navy. There's a Tom Navy. Oh yeah, yeah. my god. Um, of course Luke's saying though, I'm I'm giving an ordered account of what happened. I mean he, well, he actually he, he says it, so. he's following what he was told precisely, which yes. is the opposite of what historians do, which is critically examine and reject and, and accept certain things. So rather than slavishly follow what you were told, and of course I also think Luke is lying. Uh, I don't think he slavishly followed anything. He changes everything. He changes Mark, his source. He changes either Matthew or Q, depending on what you believe in. Uh, and so he's clearly not slavishly following his source. So he actually isn't telling the truth when he says I slavishly followed my sources. Uh, but he also doesn't name his sources. He doesn't say who they are, how, how, why he trusts them, why we should trust them. He also doesn't even say that they were eyewitnesses. He, he sort of vaguely says that it was passed on from eyewitnesses, but he doesn't say that he himself communicated with eyewitnesses or read anything that eyewitnesses wrote. He's basically just saying that what I was received was handed on by eyewitnesses somewhere down the line, which is just a faith statement. It's not. He doesn't give us any evidence to believe that he confirmed that that was actually the case. It's just what he believes or what he is asserting. So, so Luke is actually not reliable in that in that sense. And when you start looking at how he changes the chronology from Paul. Um, he has Paul already well known and living in Judea before he converts when Paul says I was unknown to anyone in Judea until many many years after I converted uh, so there's lots of things that Luke is doing that clearly shows that he's rewriting history to sell wait what do you mean I, I, I just don't understand what you're saying what? so about Paul not being well known versus Paul being well known I... in Judea so Paul himself in Galatians says I was unknown to, by face to anyone in Judea only by reputation until many years after he converted Acts has Paul already in Judea participating in the stoning of Stephen before he even converts several chapters later. So, uh, so the idea but, that but could he have gotten that information? I mean, because you could like okay, like take well, I mean, who's lying now. though? Is it is it Paul or Acts? Well, well, not necessarily lying, no, 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 but no, just no. learning something new later. Yeah, because I mean, like okay, this is like your first time here in the area. No, Paul is our eyewitness. Like he's he says he wasn't there. Acts is the later author who's well. He's him just there, saying so. they don't, they don't know me by face. They only know me by reputation. Yeah. Well, that's not saying that he's never been there before, though. By anyone in the churches, he was actually there when at the stoning of Stephen, so there would have been other Christians present. So that's like... it's. But he silly. wasn't a Christian yet at that point. No, no, no. But yeah. No, no. He means he was known by reputation as a persecutor of Christianity. 
So that's the thing is like he oh, wasn't even. Yeah. He says as a persecutor, like he didn't have to be a. No, he was Christian ravaging yet. the churches in in the diaspora. He wasn't even in Judea doing this stuff. And so, uh, so that for Acts seems to like suddenly, a contradiction. yeah, for Acts to suddenly put Paul in Judea and have him appointed to go persecute Christians by the uh, Jewish authorities in Judea, and then uh, his, immediately the like his first mission, he's converted on the road to Damascus. Well, I don't uh, think it was his first mission, but I mean, it's but, it's but also though, in Acts, yeah. he's holding the coats. I'm thinking that that's probably the low man on the totem pole, John <laughs> Bolt. I mean, seriously, I mean, if you're like a, you know, if you're the one in well, charge, well, notice you know, like like there is no extended persecution. Uh, for Paul, like immediately he's there. They're handing him the coats, and then he's given papers to go off to Damascus to persecute Christians, and then he's converted before he even gets there. So this is not M P Paul's story at all. Like Luke is rewriting uh, the, the sequence of events. He changes, for example, like it's Paul who had the vision that confirmed him that we don't have to be kosher anymore. Or the Gentiles don't have to convert to Judaism more specifically. Uh, but Acts Peter, has Peter yeah. do this oh, okay, right so. long before Luke is trying to create this image of the church has always been in harmony, whereas. Paul makes it very clear that he had to really, this is a hard sell. He had to actually put, like, convince them that this was an okay thing to do. And then, you know, they have that meeting and eventually come to an agreement, like, you can preach to the Gentiles and keep doing that, and we'll preach to the, to the Jews. And, of course, there's still strife and enmity over them maybe not holding up to that agreement on either side. So but it was just really one to eat ham and bacon. Yeah, yeah. So, but the point is, is like, that, this is just an example. They had to find a way. Um, Luke also gets the sequence of, of rebels wrong. Like he has, uh, when he's talking about Theodos and Judas the Galilean, he gets the chronology wrong and things like that. And and so the, Luke is not necessarily doing everything absolutely right. And sometimes he's, in my opinion, very clearly trying to rewrite history to sell a certain point of view. And so I, I think Luke's very unreliable in that regard. Especially since we see all this new elaboration long after the original story that he's using as his source, which is Mark, that doesn't have any of that elaboration in it. Uh, and Luke doesn't cite any sources for the new stuff that he's putting in. I didn't know that this was going to be like the question that spoke directly to you <laughs> on like a very fundamental level. <laughs> well, no, I just, this is a major area of my research. It's exactly. It's research, so, you know. Yeah, so. <laughs> so, moving on. <laughs> came up in the debate like so what, what we just didn't do was debate the actual question of the truth but mm -hmm. but the problem of proving the truth did come up like, right. like, like this is an actual problem with your worldview is that right and, <laughs> this, this and more, more specifically not, not just that you can't prove christianity but you have no way of proving that your <clears throat> idea of what true christianity is right can be proved you, you can't appeal to evidence you can't phone god like god's not going to come down in the debate and say yep you were right joel mcdermott right <laughs> uh, you know it's like like we, we have and i brought this up in the debate like we have no way of adjudicating Mm -hmm. And so what do Christians do? They either just make stuff up mm -hmm. or, or let their prejudices and biases or whatever come out. Or, or they, they start they, a new denomination. <laughs> right. Or they appeal to evidence mm -hmm. as to what's better. And I kind of got him to admit, like, like if evidence contradicts scripture, he would conclude that he was misinterpreting scripture. Mm -hmm. So he would always reinterpret scripture in light of the evidence. I'm like, how is that any different from what I'm doing? Right. You know, it's, it's right. Like, if you're, not, now, if you're just right. talking about his exactly. exactly. So if, 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 if you want to get into, like, what actually it. happened, now, now, now we're now getting into a different point. Now, okay. But see here, you're talking about, so 500 years later is Arian. Now we have some uh, historians before that, but if you look at Arian, Arian tells us that his methods, he says, I use three eyewitness accounts. He names them, he explains who they were, he explains why uh, they're reliable, and then he says, when they agree, I'm just going to state what happened, and when they disagree, I'll say how they disagree. And so Arian is giving us a much more reliable, even 500 years later, he's relying on eyewitness stuff, he cites the eyewitnesses, he's actually using their texts. We don't have that for like the Gospels. We don't have a thing like uh, where you have someone, let's say Luke, saying, "Yeah, I've got all these writings from the apostles who were actually there and saw Jesus. These are the names of them. This is the books they wrote. This is why I trust them, and this is how I'm using them." And so, like, we don't have that uh, for Jesus, but we do for Alexander the Great. Even if all we had was Arian, which was 500 years later, but we have much more for attestation of his existence, which is different from specific events of his life. You know, people debate like what actually happened in the time of Alexander. <laughs> Why do you even need the scriptures then? Just toss them and go to the evidence. Right. Like, you know, right. we we, we, we know of forty gospels that were written. Forty gospels. Mm -hmm. So what was the motive of the other thirty-six authors who clearly were lying, making up gospel stories? We have Acts of John, the Acts of Peter, and all of this stuff. What is their motivation in making up those stories? It's exactly yeah. the same. Motivation. Mary Magdalene, Judas, Thomas. Yeah, and we have this. You know, well, just I mean, those. those I mean, I mean, but even I mean, mentioning those. Those. Are really agreed upon as being very late, and so and probably the not even written same. by the people. But the point is, the motive is the same. Well, I think it's a big difference because if if these are written earlier, and and I'm not even. And, I well, mean, remember, I, we're talking a whole lifetime later, so we have no evidence that they anyone would, they, they dispute after. that though, Richard. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're <laughs> yeah, early I mean, gospel I, guys. I, oh, I, I see. I, I see. Yeah. I'm post seventy. And, on and all and so, yeah. yeah. 
so it's like to me, even if you're writing, I don't know, even if you're writing into the second century, uh, Christian is not really what you want to be if you're living in that area. I mean, there's a lot of persecution. Well, that's true for, for that all the minor Jewish sects too. So, I mean, that's there's a lot of. I mean, you could look at the uh, the way the Mormons were treated and say like, well, why are they being Mormons? Why are they making up these stories? Why are they writing these texts? Uh, and yet, you know, look at how persecuted Joseph Smith was. How difficult, you know, he got killed, almost killed multiple yeah, times. Yeah. So, so that that argument doesn't really hold water. Like, there, when people are, for example, the Christian sect is actually fits into a category, an anthropological category. And that's, this is element twenty nine in on the historicity of Jesus. We have an example like the ghost dance movement. The cargo cults themselves are an example. Um, there's a variety of uh, more persecuted sects. So when you have a class of people that are put down upon, they're pressed upon. Their lives suck, and the major society is not helping them, and the ex existing religions are not helping them. What they do is they go to a countercultural mode, where they have this apocalyptic idea, where they throw all their basically all their uh, all their resources and and confidence into this one uh, thing that they think is going to restore hope. So it's going to it's you know Jesus is going to come and sort this all out, and meanwhile we're going to actually recreate the kingdom that he's going to bring here in our own churches. We're going to take care of ourselves and bring more people in. To, to, so we can take care of everybody. And, and so it's, it's a social movement that is against the oppressors. They're already oppressed. So this idea that they're willing to die for this new vision for society that's going to improve society and lead to salvation for so many people, they really commit to it because they have to believe it. Otherwise, they would be in, in even greater despair. And so when you find these, it usually happens in this case. We have imperial societies that have an extreme amount of oppression and poverty, and you've got uh, uh, multiple races and, cl and cultures intermixing and there's a variety of other properties I talk about. It's, this is an anthropological model, so I cite the anthropological literature. We have a lot of other examples of this. So these kinds of movements actually happen all the time. Uh, well, I mean, throughout history, if you get the big picture. It tends to be a sort of anthropological phenomenon. And it's what they're fighting, dying for, what they're investing in is a new vision for society. This, you would agree this, this with that hope too, for right? a future. Yeah, that but, they don't they aren't getting from the wider society. They don't yeah. feel that they're getting it from the temple cult, for example. That's why they become an anti-temple cult. Um, so that this is it's it's really there's they, they attach this social and moral views, their idea of the hope for the future, to this theology, and that they tie them together the same way like the unification of England tied it to the the myth of King Arthur, like and, and, and so that it came to the point where people who would deny the historicity of King Arthur were perceived as denying the the, the goodness of unifying the United Kingdom. And so that they, they, these become tied together so you can't separate the two, or at least it's very difficult to separate the two. And then people will be willing to die for the, the, the shibboleth, for the, the, the symbol of the thing that they're actually dying for, which is this new vision for society and this hope for the future. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's on my book, uh, On the Historicity of Jesus. Okay. I actually work out the margins of my probabilities on that, like the extremes on both sides. And so I say it's somewhere in between these two values. I cannot assert with confidence that it's anywhere in between. And the, the, the one you'd be most interested in would be the top, which would be one in three. That'd be the highest probability. And so I think it's at least as low as that, uh, one in three, which is actually respectable odds of existing. It's just not as high as people want. Yeah. Irony means uh, uh, unexpected coincidence, basically. It right. So when you have a ton of weird, unexpected coincidences all packed into one story, we always doubt that story is but, being true. Like, that, that's just all history all, of all cultures. He claims... Uh, claimed? dead. But anyway. Uh, sure. <laughs> oh wait, he's not dead. Scientology is true! Yay. Okay, he's, he's moved Oops. on into another form. Um, okay, not fully inaccurate, but for example, the, those are specific comments made about specific things that he did. Not So it's like, like the incompetent one. Mm -hmm. I don't call Ehrman incompetent in general. I say like this particular argument is incompetent or demonstrates incompetence in this one particular thing. And so if you just focus on, on those things and pretend like I'm calling all his work and everything he does incompetent or all of those other things, mm -hmm. no, they're, they're those in context, those are specific arguments I make and I actually provide the evidence that shows that they're true, right? So it's not just that. I think he phoned it in on Je did Jesus exist and, and even some people suspect that he had a grad student do it and doesn't want to admit uh, that that was the case and therefore he can't like, correct the errors in it that are like really bad. Because it was really sloppy work compared to, like, for example, forged or uh, what that's the pop market version, but forgery and counter forgery was the official academic book. Those are really excellent books. He did a really good job on those. And so he, he can do this. It's just he has to actually put in the time and not re engage in polemics when he's four. Yeah, that's interesting that you didn't make any of those up. They're all yeah, things that have been claimed. It's just it, cause which, I was trying. which one was Jerry Falwell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're trying to make them up. It's yeah. like, you can't make this shit up. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's a good one because there's like, yeah, there's you can find tons of these like crazy things like who said this. 
So, and especially against people like Peter and, and others who supposedly were disciples of Jesus. So he should be facing this argument all the time. He must, should have to respond to it like, well, they said Jesus said this, or he was so-and-so was actually there, or Jesus did this. And there's other examples, like he would use examples of from the Old Testament of models to follow, but he doesn't use examples from the life of Jesus as models to follow. He doesn't quote the parables. So there's, you should at least have, like if you're writing 20,000 words about someone, and that's really what these letters are, for you to never mention anything that happened in their life that, that you actually concretely put as happening on earth uh, is weird. And, and especially when you're arguing with people that supposedly are basing their teachings on what Jesus said or did in their life, they should be posing arguments to him that's based on that, so he should be responding to those arguments. But that's not what we see. All we see is competing revelations. This is everybody sees, sees Jesus in revelations. I get revelations. And even in Romans uh, 16, he says the gospel and teaching of Jesus comes by revelation and from the scriptures. He doesn't mention from the disciples who sat at his feet. Like, it's not in there. So when you add all this up, it's just weird. It looks really strange. Uh, we would expect something different than that. The way that we, we prevent crime, the way that we get people to be moral, it's all about child development. It's mm. all about, like, we, we have a lot of science on this. And even, even child nutrition. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When the brain is forming. Yeah. Correct, correct. Healthcare. My right. gosh. Yeah, that was the thing. So he's against uh, universal healthcare. Of course. Of course. Because uh, that means like some guy in a lab coat is making all his decisions for you, which is absolutely not how that works. Death panel. Yeah. He didn't say death panel, but right. it, was, it was that kind of fear. It's like, right. I don't want some guy in a lab coat making decisions for me. And it's like, um, you know, that's not how it works. There's a thing called medical consent. and Anyway, but, uh, but no, I, I was making the point that if you look free universal healthcare, <laughs> has had a huge effect in impacting poverty mm -hmm. and, and allowing people to, to get better educations, to be smarter mm -hmm. and, and take care of themselves better, be more moral and so on. So universal health care is really like the foundation of society. It's important. We, now that we can afford it mm -hmm. uh, as a first world country, we should have it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and all other first world countries are already there. They've been doing it for decades. And right. so we have all this data. You can't say that it's evil and it's ruining the... His, these aren't like blighted wastescapes. <laughs> Two factors is, is the fact that we have the highly mythological, mythically constructed Gospels and no mundane history before them. So it doesn't go from mundane to mythologized, where right? like we have Alexander the Great, where it gets mundane and it gets more mythologized over time. You wouldn't nece necessarily expect that, though, would you? Not necessarily. Yeah, it'd um, be nice, but... But, uh, but the fact that that happens, that's... Uh, piece of evidence, but the strongest evidence I think, and probably the most decisive, is how either silent Paul is or how ambiguous he is on the historicity of Jesus. There should be much more impactful representation of the historicity of Jesus in the letters of Paul. Like that should have come up tons of times, and for him to address it. And the, the fact that it's just not in there is, is actually the problem. Well, well the point is, is a problem though, because uh, that was a polemic against the cult, so it's, it's like not true. Okay, it's true of what people said about the cult, but it's not what the cult taught. And it's not something that actually happened. He doesn't say earthly woman. He says born of a woman. Uh, and that's... Yeah, and it's, it's ambiguous because in the context of the argument, he gets to later talking about how we're also born of a woman, but he, he says allegorical women. These are uh, Hagar and Sarah, two, the woman who represents the earthly order and the woman who represents the heavenly order. We are born of Hagar in the sense that we're born of the world, earthly orders. I thought wrong. Well, there are so many tribes. There's a lot of interesting ethnographic details that we've gotten. Yeah. yeah. If you look at the ethnographic record in general, like anthropologists have collected like 500 of them. They all have strange things in them. That, that there was a historical Jesus of some kind, and you had to put a number on that. Uh, my would book, you say it's zero, or would you say oh, no, it's... no, no, no. My, my book uh, on the history of Jesus, I uh -huh. actually work, I test my margins of error in terms of you know, controlling for my biases mm -hmm. and everything. And the upper margin is one in three. One in three. One in three chance that there okay. was a historical Jesus. So around 33. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, roughly around there. And Which then, is right. also the, day, the year Jesus was... Uh... <laughs> well, my lower bound is one in 12, Crucified. roughly one in 12,000. So even that's not zero. Wow. Um, but, but that's still not like that low a probability. If, if you had a one in 12,000 chance that your car would explode when you got into it, you would not get into your car, right? I would get so it's not car. really that low a probability. It yeah. sounds low, but it's not. It's not like one in a billion or one yeah, in a yeah. trillion. Yeah. Like, you start talking about the existence We're of... We're nowhere close to a Six Sigma. Right, right? yeah. Right. So, <laughs> you know, the Christian God exists. Now you're in the billions or trillions. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> so.